Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is on the seasons of life. This is lesson number six in that series for May 11 of 2019, entitled The Royal Love Song. I think we mentioned that there are just a few of Solomon's songs. They wrote a thousand of them, but there are just a few of them that we have recorded, and this is one of the, this is the biggest one, I'm sure. So this is our chance to look at that. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we gather around this table now to talk about your plan for marriage. And it's as expressed by these two individuals and a few others making comments and uh, presumably a wonderful marriage relationship or partnership. We need to understand the language here and the symbolism, which often is probably not understood, to help us to do that correctly today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to attempt to discuss the spiritual implications and the applications of one of the most important seasons of our lives, the event of marriage and the sexuality accompanying it. God intended for husbands and wives to become one flesh. That's what it says right there in the first chapter. Each individual has a set of dominant characteristics that needs to be balanced by the characteristics of another significantly different person. You've probably seen lists, okay? These are the things that are more like men, and these are the things that are more like women. Um, those lists don't always perfectly fit all men or all women, but they are useful. So as we come to care about our future spouses and hopefully learn to go out of our way to make them happy, we learn some of the most difficult and some of the most important lessons about love which is a predominant feature of God's character. Under ideal circumstances, we each can learn to become more like God as our natural characteristics blend into that one flesh condition. Sexuality and the desire to have that most intimate relationship with our spouses should be one of the reasons why we are willing to accept such changes. Do I need to ask the spouses in the room uh, if they're willing to make some adjustments to their plans to accommodate their spouses? Hmm. Well, it's we're a requirement. It's a requirement. I see. My wife told me. I see. <laughs> <laughs> we need to be honest up front and admit that as one Adventist author put it, in fact, this is the, was the title of his book, God Invented Sex. So we're going to talk about that today. Satan, who is determined to do everything he can to destroy the work of God and to promote his characteristic, which is selfishness. selfishness, instead of love, has worked to pervert marriage in every way he can. A quick look around at our world would convince almost anyone how successful Satan has been. How many times have you read the book Song of Solomon? Several times. Several. It's, you know, usually it's a part of a, a larger reading plan. You don't say, oh, I think today we should read the Song of Solomon. <laughs> it doesn't usually happen quite like that. And even when it is read, many do not understand the images being presented there. Now, don't, I re don't I recall that uh, for the Hebrews this was not allowed to read until you were 30 years old? Yes. Oh, That's is that for, right? Yes. I didn't know that. And, and, and some people said it should be read only by men. <laughs> but I will tell you that Song of Solomon is one of the five books that is read in its entirety on one of the Jewish national holidays. Which holiday is it? I was afraid you'd ask me of that. Um, I don't remember. The Anchor Bible Commentary, it's about the thickest volume yeah. of, of all the commentaries. There's more, there's more variations in how to interpret this book than there are any other book in the Bible. Is that right? There are, oh man, the, all the variations that people have done with this book, all the allegorical interpretations of it are just beyond belief. All the way from this is an allegory of Christ and the Church of to course. almost literal, interpreta literal yeah. reading. 
many of the more puritanical Reformation theologians, I won't need, I don't need to mention them by name, have tried to make this a book only about God's relationship to his people or even Christ's relationship to the church. While some of that may be true, it is first and foremost a story of a relationship between a Shulamite maiden and probably King Solomon himself. Those who have tried to suggest that this book is all about some allegorical meaning have really struggled to explain all the very explicit sexual ideas found in this book. I mean, allegorical, and you're talking about breasts and thighs and, uh, you know, how does that fit? On the other hand, the fact that marriage is supposed to be a very exclusive and intimate relationship with just one other person who is different than we are should teach us about our relationship with the one true God. Think about the differences between us and God. Well, look at a few verses. Genesis 2, verse 7. When the Lord God made the universe, okay, Psalm 63, 1. O oh God, you are my God, and I long for you. My whole being desires you. Like a dry, worn out, a waters, waters land, my soul is thirsty for you. Psalms 84, 2. How I want to be there. I long to be in the Lord's temple. With my whole being, I sing for joy to the living God. 1 Corinthians 16, 9, I'm sorry, 6, 19 and 20. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and who was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourselves, but to God. He bought you for a price, so use your bodies for God's glory. And then 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. May the God who gives us peace and make you gives us peace, make you holy in every way, and keep your whole being, spirit, soul, and body, free from every fault of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Surely these verses suggest that God wants us to have a very close and intimate relationship not only with other human beings, specifically our spouses, but with Him. Unfortunately, many of the Christian religions today take a dualistic approach to their understanding of the human body. What do we mean by that? That there's a part that uh, exists separate from the material. Okay. And Which in a soul? practical sense, I mean, it's like software and the computer, you know, yeah. they, they don't work apart from each other, yep. but they would say that, no, the soul can exist apart from the body. Yeah. So that's okay. where the, the so difference it's the, comes in. The soul versus body is the dualistic approach that many Christians still believe today. But that goes back a long ways in yes. Greek times all the way back to Plato in Greek times and actually he got his ideas from some people before him. Seventh-day Adventists, that's us, believe that the body plus the spirit, otherwise known as the breath, make a soul or a person. You put the two together. You take the, the breath and you take the body, you put those to go together and you make them alive. You have a soul or a person. There's no other kind of soul. They are a single unit. What affects the body affects the spirit and affects the soul. There is no separating them except in death. And in death, they all cease to exist physically sooner or later. I, I, you know, there are people who say, well, when God recreates us and takes us to heaven, he's going to put all the original pieces back together. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I think about that, I think, Imagine what's happened to Adam's body by now. There, there, there are even people suggested that there's a little piece of Adam in all of us. <laughs> Maybe so, I have no idea. But, I mean, it would be completely impossible for God to put you know, all the individual atoms back together to make us just impossible. So those atoms have been recycled. Reused. They have been recycled and recycled and recycled. I don't know if you'd say it was impossible, but it's not necessary. Yeah, not necessary. Well, the reason I say it's impossible, what if Adam, part of Adam is in you? Then what's he going to do? Mm. They had to go through Noah's yeah. progeny before it yeah. got back that far. <laughs> yeah. so. so think of all the perversions of God's ideal that have crept into religion through the centuries. As we know, there are a large group of people who believe that to be really religious, 
one must avoid marriage and devote oneself completely to the religious life. God could have designed a large variety of other ways for humans to reproduce themselves. Why do you think God chose this particular way? Do we? I think he wanted us to experience love and intimacy mm -hmm. and closeness. Mm -hmm. Well, I think life is about relationships, and so yeah. this is the, the core relationship that others are built on. And this is the perfect environment in which to raise children. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, from a human perspective. I mean, obviously, it would be great if we could send our kids to heaven and let God raise them. <laughs> How about the idea that uh, could there be other worlds that have the ability to reproduce themselves? We don't know of any. Yeah. That's just something that's not talked about anywhere. Yeah. It was God who designed the human body, the male body and the female body. No doubt he thought he had done a marvelous job. Uh, what did he say at the end? Good. It was good. very good. Very good. There's an apocryphal story, what I, but I like it even if it's apocryphal, that suggests that after God had made Adam, he took one good look and said, I can do better than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, all, all joking aside, look at a few verses from Song of Solomon. Verse 2, the woman speaking, Your lips cover me with kisses. Your love is better than wine. And verse 13, My lover has a scent of myrrh as he lies upon my breasts. Verses two, verse, chapter 2, verse 6, His left hand is under my head as his right hand caresses me. 5, 10 to 16, My lover is handsome and strong. He's one in 10,000. His face is bronze and smooth. His hair is wavy, black as a raven. His eyes are... And you can imagine the people who've tried to allegorize this. Oh man, they have some explanation for every one of these details. His eyes were as beautiful as doves by a flowing brook, doves washed in milk and standing by the stream. His cheeks are, are as lovely as a garden. Um, I better go over here so I can read the rest of it. His cheeks are as lovely as a garden that is full of herbs and spices. His lips are like lilies, wet with liquid myrrh. His hands are well formed and he wears rings set with gems. His body is like smooth ivory with sapphires set in it. His thighs are columns of alabaster set in sockets of gold. He is majestic like the Lebanon mountains with their towering cedars. His mouth is sweet to kiss. Everything about him enchants me. That is what my lover is like, women of Jerusalem. Okay. Well, so do I dare to take on one more passage like that? <laughs> Chapter 7. What a wonderful woman you are. How beautiful your feet in sandals. The curve of your thighs is like the work of an artist. A bowl is there that never runs out of spiced wine. A sheaf of wheat is there, surrounded by lilies. Your breasts are like twin deers, like two gazelles. Your neck is like a tower of ivory. Your, your eyes are like the pools in the city of Heshbon, near the gate of that great city. And just a little diversion. Some of you know that uh, Adventist scholars and archaeologists have, have, uh, have done archaeology in the city of Heshbon, the ancient city of Heshbon for years and years, and they have found those pools at the gate of Heshbon. Hmm. Your nose is, a lovely, is, lovely, is as lovely as the Tower of Lebanon you, that stands guard at Damascus. Your head is held high like Mount Carmel. Your braided hair shines like the finest satin. Its beauty could hold a king captive. How pretty you are, how beautiful, how complete the delights of your love. You are as graceful as a palm tree, and your breasts are clusters of dates. I will climb the palm tree and pick its fruit. To me, your breasts are like bunches of grapes, your, your breath like the fragrance of apples. And then the woman replies, and your mouth like the finest wine, then let the wine flow straight to my lover, flowing over his lips and teeth. Wow. Okay. Pretty graphic. Yep. <laughs> Beautiful. In these passages, the sexual aspects of the human body and the sexual behaviors normally involved in intimacy are clearly spelled out. I will tell you that... Uh, if you use the strictest criteria for rating movies, the triple X movies, there's a part of the Bible that would qualify very well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and these passages, the sexual aspects of the human body and the sexual behaviors normally involved in intimacy are clearly spelled out. 
their lips covered with kisses, their breasts, beautiful hands that caress, eyes that are beautiful, thighs like columns of alabaster, kisses that are sweet, feet that are beautiful in sandals, artistic curves of thighs, beautiful noses, shiny braided hair, and breath like the fragrance of apples, etc. But unfortunately, as we well know, even this most intimate of relationships that is supposed to teach us about God's love can be turned into something that is even abusive to a marriage partner. Almost every culture has some sexual taboos. Many cultures forbid parents to speak openly to their children about sex. I work with a lot of young Hispanic women, and they fairly often talk about the fact that sex is not to be discussed in the family. Sometimes, and I can tell you in Africa, where I spent many years, some, that, that you know, young people aren't supposed to know about that stuff. Sometimes there's a special, lesson, a special session, session held just before the marriage takes place to try to inform the two new partners separately about what to expect. Wow. That, that's even in our culture in a certain church. Yes. While many of the more primitive cultures have sexual taboos and thus prevent couples from having almost any real understanding of what true Christian love as expressed in sexuality is supposed to be all about, Western society has come to think that one must experiment with different partners in order to find out one the one that best suits his or her personal needs, <laughs> as if we're shopping, right? This very selfish approach to sexuality and many other aspects of this most intimate of relationships has proven to be very destructive to true Christian marriages. No wonder there are so many divorces. Well, how much are we as Seventh-day Adventists influenced by the cultural norms around us? Are we willing to admit that? Some think that sexual intimacy is supposed to be some kind of animal-like passion, while others think it is something shameful that must never be talked about. The Bible dismisses each of those extremes. While the entire book of Song of Solomon is about love, note especially the aspects of love mentioned in these verses, and many of those are some of the ones that I just read to you, in very beautiful terms and exquisite Hebrew poetry, the various aspects of sexual love are described. Two very important principles are particularly emphasized in this book. First, the fact that marriage partners are supposed to be initially good friends. Now, you wouldn't get that from just a superficial reading of the Book of Song of Solomon, but it's in there. You're they are to get be good friends before anything yes. else. They are, get, they are to get to know each other well and to learn how to communicate with each other in as many different ways as possible apart from sex. By far the best marriages are marriages where the husbands and wives are best friends. Amen. It is absolutely essential that couples get to know each other well before they engage in a sexual relationship. And you know, I, I don't have time to watch movies. Um, obviously I spent all, virtually all my spare time working on these presentations and Sabbath school lessons and so forth. But apart from that, when you turn on a typical movie, it comes on on the, on the television maybe and you're watching it, and you can almost guarantee that on the first date they're going to be in bed together. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, what, what does that say to our children? Not just movies, every half hour sitcom almost. Well, it's absolutely it's essential. It's part of our culture, really. Yeah. Yeah. anymore. It's like shaking hands. <laughs> yeah. That's terrible. Yeah. I even had a student at La Sierra tell me that it should be about the same as shaking hands. Yeah, well, Dr. Provencia, one of our famed uh, former professors here at the university, used to say divorce, uh, he used to say adultery is more than just the wrong skin touching the wrong skin. Well, it is absolutely essential that couples get to know each other very well before they engage in a sexual relationship. Otherwise, a sexual relationship may begin to dominate their thinking about each other and cause them to overlook other aspects of their relationship, which are also important. I've heard marriage counselors say, young people need to learn how to sit, need to learn how to talk sitting at opposite ends of the Davenport. 
depends so, upon how big that Davenport is. Yeah, it needs to be a fair size. <laughs> Not a love seat. Ago, that's how it was. <laughs> <laughs> no, not a love seat. That's right. What? <clears throat> I say about a hundred years or so ago. That's how it was. Yeah. Well, if you look back in the early years of America, for example, they and how in, in winter when it got really cold, about the only place you could keep warm was in bed. So they they literally designed beds with a lockdown board in the middle. In the middle. <laughs> Amish would do those. Yeah, I thought that was just in the Scandinavian countries. <laughs> no. Well, maybe they brought it over from Scandinavia. I think they called it bundling or something like that. Yeah. Bundling. It sounds, doesn't sound like bundling. It sounds like separating to me. Well, they put a board down the middle. <laughs> they uh, are yeah. all my stories anyway. I remember. Oh, yeah. I had heard that expression used also for that's that practice. Bundling? Bundling. Oh, oh really? Comforters. Well, You'd so bundle up. Yeah, you know, you would be all. It wouldn't be just the covers. It would be you would be all bundled up. Well, throughout the poem, we're talking here about the Song of Solomon. Intimate compliments and love gestures co convey the strong attraction, the physical and emotional delight that the male and female find in each other. And every time I read that statement, I think, okay, now, where in Solomon's life did this take place? In the midst of his seven hundred wives and three hundred. Maybe with the first one. First wife? Possibly. We know that his first wife was a, an Egyptian princess. Yes. That's about other so, than... So who was the Shulamite? Well, like I said, we don't know. But Shulamite, uh, she was clearly someone from an area, I mean, that's an area in the northern kingdom of Israel. But probably not from Egypt. Then. No. <clears throat> well, um, the natural intimacies of romantic love are a gift of the Creator to help partners bond closely to, closely to each other in marriage. As partners are open to the work of divine love in their hearts, the human love is refined and purified, elevated and ennobled, a foretaste of heaven. And Carrie, I think you're going to tell us about that. Yes. The divine love emanating from Christ never destroys human love, but includes it. But in human love is refined and purified, elevated and ennobled. Human love can never bear its precious fruit until it is united with the divine nature and trained to go heavenward. Jesus wants to see happy marriages, happy firesides. The warmth of true friendship and the pure love that binds the hearts of husband and wife are a foretaste of heaven. And that's from Signs of the Times. Mrs. White wrote that. September 6, 1899. It's interesting that she wrote that 18 years after her husband had died. Mm. Let us be honest enough to recognize that real godlike love is not natural for human beings. It is only the molding, sanctifying process, the work of the Holy Spirit, that can transform us into truly loving marriage partners. And we are happy to say that that ideal relationship between a husband and a wife, which will lead to ever-growing love for each other, is the perfect environment in which to raise children. Children should always be planned for and never just accidents. So how does this kind of sexual in intimacy reflect in its own way the kind of intima intimacy we can have with God? Can you name some parallels? Well, God loves to have us spend time with Him. That would be one example, right? Father, Son, and or Holy Spirit. They bless us when we give ourselves completely to them. That's another example, just to mention a couple. And Jesus prayed that we would be one, mm -hmm. um, that they the would be one. one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's still a sense in which uh, it's not the same because uh, uh, when God said of Adam, it is not good that uh, man should be alone. Obviously, he wasn't alone because God was there with him. So there, yeah. there was uh, he, he had a, uh, the woman had a different role than God does in terms of the relationship. Well, could one feel the same closeness to God that one might have in a good marriage with one's spouse? Hopefully, closer because that's the foundation of the, mm -hmm. the relationship. With in what the ways is it different? Well, obviously, it's different because we can't touch God at this point in time. 
Many scholars, especially those familiar with the original languages, think of the Song of Solomon poem as being almost Id as idyllic as the Garden of Eden. We're familiar, familiar with what the scripture says about the creation of Adam and then Eve. What kind of marital counseling did God give Adam and Eve? Did he, did he say choose wisely? <laughs> <laughs> be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Did, he, did they have any idea what he was even talking about? Or did he just expect them to discover things for themselves? Well, they studied the animals, and the animals probably <laughs> had instinct to guide them. I hope we didn't have to just wait for the animals to show us. <laughs> yeah. No, but I'm just saying by, yeah. you know, they, they would have studied things. Don't you wish we had a record of all, the, all of God's instructions for our first parents? Mm -hmm. Not just about sexual matters, but all the instructions? Wouldn't that be wonderful? I but always wonder how long they walked and talked together before sin appeared. And I don't think we have any real good idea for that other than, well, they probably had children after sin. And yeah, well, couldn't they, have taken too long. We know. We know that there's some other places in the Bible where God specifically practiced family planning, if we can call it that, and prevented children from being born for one reason or another. Um, that could have happened in the Garden of, Good, of Eden. Did he promote or birth? Either one. Did God promote conception sometimes like Bathsheba and David? Well, a, a, a couple of class, yeah, okay, a couple of classic, classic examples, that's one of them. I mean, here is Bathsheba, who's been married for a considerable period of time to a husband, presumably a strong, virile man because he was a great warrior, and she didn't have a single child. If she'd had a child, there would have been none of the David stuff at all. And David has intercourse with her on one occasion, and she gets pregnant. What happened? Timing was perfect. <laughs> okay, well. We figure David was about 50 when this happened. Probably. And so she might have been young, not married very long either. We don't know how old she was. Who knows? There are other examples in the Bible where Judah, you know, one, one time, bang, she's pregnant. Look at Genesis 2, 24 and 25. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife and they become one. The man and the woman were both naked, but they were not embarrassed. Okay, what's that all about? Is it because there was no one else around to be embarrassed? In uh, Patriarchs and Prophets five, uh, 57, this paragraph here, after his transgression, Adam at first imagined himself entering on a higher state of existence. But soon the thought of his sin filled him with terror. The air which had hitherto been of a mild and uniform temperature seemed to chill the guilty pair. The love and peace which had been theirs was gone, and in its place they felt a sense of sin, of dread of the future, a nakedness of soul. The robe of light which had enshrouded them mm -hmm. now disappeared, and yeah. to supply its place they endeavored to fashion uh, for themselves a covering, for they could not, while unclothed, meet the eye of God and holy angels. Wow. So what does that mean? I, I remember the remarks of uh, someone who was asked to, picture, to, to make a picture, a nice picture of Adam and Eve. And the, someone else reminded him, remember they were wearing a robe of light. And the guy thought about that for a second. He says, how many watts do you want? <laughs> <laughs> Where was that quote, please, Dennis? It's in the third chapter, The Temptation and Fall. It's page 57. Page yeah. 57. Patriarchs and Prophets. Well, I mean, we say well, maybe they weren't embarrassed because they were the only ones around, but there was God. Is already, Dennis has already mentioned God the Father was there. God the Son was there. Angels were there. Why were these other creatures not re not perceived as being bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh? Was it just that they looked different? Well, Eve was taken out of Adam. Mm -hmm. 
So, I mean, that... Well, he, the rib he, was taken out. Yeah. I hope the what he ended up with looked better than just a bare rib. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he used that as his... Uh, yeah. Starting no, that's point. true. Starting point. So, I mean, uh, I mean, really... But, if, but you know... If, I, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to work this through in my own mind. Uh, I mean, was Adam attracted to Amy Angel? We just don't know. Mm -mm. Well, look at Psalms, I mean, sorry, so Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 4, verse 7 up to 5, 1. How beautiful you are, my love, how perfect you are. Come with me. From the Lebanon mountains, my bride, come with me from Lebanon. Come down from the top of Mount Amana, from Mount Sinir and Mount Hermon, where the lions and leopards live. Look, the look in your eyes, my sweetheart and bride, and the necklace you are wearing have stolen my, your, my heart. Your love delights me, my sweetheart and bride. Your love is better than wine, your perfume more fragrant than any spice. The taste of honey is on your lips, my darling. Your tongue is milk and honey for me. Your clothing has all the fragrance of Lebanon. My sweetheart, my bride, is a secret garden, a walled garden, a private spring. There's the idea of privacy, mm -hmm. exclusivity. Intimacy. Intimacy. There the plants flourish. They grow like, orchid, like an orchard of pomegranate, a pomegranate tree, orchard of pomegranate trees and bear the finest fruits. There is no lack of henna and nard, of saffron, calamus and cinnamon, or incense of every kind, myrrh and aloe. Aloes grow there with all the most fragrant perfumes, fountains, water of the garden, streams of flowing water, brooks gushing down from the Lebanon mountains. Then the woman responds, Wake up, north wind, south wind, blow on my garden, fill the air with fragrance, let my lover come to his garden and eat the best of its fruits. And the man responds, I have entered my garden, my sweetheart, sweetheart my bride, I've, I'm gathering my spices and myrrh, I'm eating my honey and my honeycomb, I am drinking my wine and milk. Well, these verses found in the center of the book are supposed to be the highlight, the consummation of the marriage. And consider Paul's words. Okay, this is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. A man should fulfill his duty as a husband, and a woman should fulfill her duty as a wife, and each should satisfy the other's needs. A wife is not the master of her own body, but her husband is. In the same way, a husband is not the master of his own body, but his wife is. This is from the American Bible Society, the uh, Holy Bible, the Good News Translation. Okay. Well, in the best of relationships, this is a perfect ideal. But think of how this ideal has been perverted, especially by males, even outside of marriage, in ways that have damaged and destroyed the lives of so many women. I... Mm -hmm. Mentions at times we we were asked to travel around Tanzania and to give lectures and seminars to especially to women about the marriage relationship and so forth and to tell the the common belief in Africa was children belong to the father the the mother is just the garden the father plants his seed and the child comes out is his it's not hers and whatever and we came around and mm. explained to women the actual facts and how it works, and they were in tears. They could not believe it. I mean, these children are really mine. So You mentioned also, I think, in the past that uh, women, if they had the idea if their f husband didn't beat them, that the husband didn't yeah. have much care for them. Yeah, well. It might be, a, but it's not all really off the subject. Yeah. Well, in this passage we just read, uh, how clearly is pictured there is a mutual attraction with no force or manipulation in any way. It is interesting to notice that both Solomon's and his Shulamite bride's names are derived from the Hebrew word shalom, meaning peace or wholeness. Notice that their expression, my beloved is mine and I'm his, really is an echo of their language in Edom. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. In the traditional language of the King James Version, which reflects the language used by the original authors in Hebrew and Greek, the word no, K-N-O-W, is used to describe the sexual relationship. This is not the word N-O, it's the word K-N-O-W. Um, and there's a lot of passages, Genesis 4, 1, 25, well, there's, there's a couple, two or three of them we probably should look at. 
Genesis 4, verse 1. Then Adam, my version says, then Adam had intercourse, intercourse with his wife and she became pregnant. But you know, if you read the King James Version, it will say, then Adam knew his wife and she bore a child. Um, and there's that idea spread through all through Scripture, even in the New Testament. In what ways is this knowing supposed to be a reflection of our relationship with God? Just a note from the Bible Study Guide, Tuesday, May 7. I'm not sure who the author is of our lesson guide. It was a, a couple that are marriage counselors. Two. Mm -hmm. Okay, no also describes the relationship between individuals and God. For the discerning Christian, the unique and tender knowledge of marriage with its companionship, commitment, and unbounded delight provides a profound insight into the most sublime and holy mystery ever, the union of Christ and the church. Wow. So how can our relationship with God bring companionship, commitment, and unbounded delight? Have we had that kind of experience? Well, the second major theme in the book of Song of Solomon is that sex should be preserved until the right time. The beautiful Shulamite woman is described as a secret garden, a walled garden, a private spring. These delights are not intended to be shared with anyone else except the marriage partner, either before marriage or after. Later, that garden is described as belonging exclusively to him. She says, let my lover come to his garden, eat the best of its fruit. And the man responds, I am drinking my wine and milk. Scholars will remind you that the Book of Song of Solomon is arranged in what is described as a chiasm, in which the ideas or wording of the book work up to a peak, and then descend again in reverse sequence toward the end of the book, so that the, part, the, the, the sections, the top sections, and, and so they're farther and farther apart down from the so the beginning ends, to, ends up sounding like the end. The exclusivity of this relationship is described in Song of Solomon um, 4, 12, and 16. And we we'll have some words about that. This is from the Bible Study Guide. In the Song of Solomon, we find some of Scripture's most compelling evidence for God's plan that people remain sexually chaste until marriage. One of the most powerful is the reference to the Shulamite's childhood, when her brothers wondered whether she would be a, open quote, wall or a door. In other words, will she remain chaste until marriage, that is a wall, or be promiscuous, a door? As an adult woman, she affirms that she, was, that she has maintained her chastity and comes pure to her husband. I am a wall. In fact, he confirms that she is still a virgin up to their wedding night by saying that she is a garden enclosed, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. From her own experience, she can counsel her friends to take the steps of love and marriage very carefully. Three times in the Song of Solomon, the Shulamite addresses a group of women referred to as the daughters of Jerusalem to counsel them not to arouse the intense passion of love until the appropriate time. That is, until they find themselves safely within the intimate covenant of marriage, as is she. For the second time in the poem, the beloved invites his bride to come away with him. That's from Song of Solomon 2, chapter 2, verse 10, and 4, verse 8. Before the wedding, she could not accept his invitation, but now that she, now it is she who invites him into her garden, Song of Solomon 4.16, and he gladly accepts Solomon, Song of Solomon 5.1. He is not just attracted to her beauty, he, she has stolen his heart, Solomon, Song of Solomon 4.9. He is intoxicated with her love, Song of Solomon 4.10. He is exuberant that she is his and nobody else's now and forever. My bride, my very own, you are a garden, a fountain closed off to all others. Song of Solomon 4.12. In his union to his perfect woman, he finds himself as reaching the promised land. Your lips are honeycomb. Milk and honey flow from your tongue, Song of Solomon 4.11. So the promised land was known as? Land flowing with milk and honey. Exactly. 
A thought question. Do you think that Solomon ever really felt this way about any woman? Well, if he wrote it, he must have had some sense of, of experience with that. Yeah. Um, I am sure that, well, we know that he married a lot of these women as, as political alliances. Some king would show up with a daughter and say, you know, let's make an agreement. Okay, you marry my daughter. Probably in that environment, Solomon, when he found someone who actually understood his language and really was, you know, chased in a, a virtuous woman, probably would really have a, attracted him. I, I, it, it's not hard for me to understand that. Some of it might be that he liked the dowry from that many different women. Important. That wealthy, might be why he, he, he kept it, but this woman didn't have any dowry. No, doesn't sound like it. Sounds yeah. like that was true love there. Well, of course, the next question is, what did all the other wives think about her? Well, we need to be honest when discussing a lesson like this, that we do not turn off all those who may have been tempted to follow some forbidden pathways in the past. What do we know about that? Well, 1 John 1, 9. But if we confess our sins to God, he will keep his promise and do what is right. He will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all wrongdoing. And Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our sins from us. That's God's plan. And then Isaiah 55, verse 7, let the wicked leave their way of life and change their way of thinking. Let them turn to the Lord our God. He is merciful and quick to forgive. And John 8, 11, where Jesus himself said, go and sin no more. Wow. Well, God is eternally forgiving. He died in order to forgive our sins. Well, in creation, God apparently made Adam and gave him some of his own characteristics. Then he created Eve and gave her some of his own char other characteristics. Um, and I might add, the Hebrew language has both male and female forms. The, 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 the nouns can have both the male and female forms. And approximately half of the references to God in the Old Testament are female. Right. People don't recognize that. It is only when we come together in the one flesh relationship that they can form a perfect image to the Father God. Well, and if you read Proverbs, wisdom is the voice of God. Mm -hmm. It's always referred to as she. Mm -hmm. I always thought the Holy Spirit probably represented the female side of the Godhead. Yet, it was the Holy Spirit that came over, uh, came over Mary and... So that wouldn't fit. Anyway, why did God make us the first group ever, as far as we know, to be able to reproduce ourselves? Had he already foreseen what was coming? Remember that he only made two of us. So all of the other worlds, wherever they are, uh, presumably he made every individual person who lived on those places. But that's kind of speculative, isn't yeah. it? He told our parents to multiply and fill the earth, right? Mm -hmm. Try to imagine what the universe would be like if Satan had the ability to reproduce himself. Nope. The universe would be full of little Satans. You can be sure of it. Or big Satans. <laughs> or big Satans, wow. Okay, we cannot address the issue of marriage in our current society in Western culture without dealing with some of the variations of marriage that seem to be taking over our world. And Leviticus 27 through 21, Romans 1, 24 to 20. Let me read the Romans 1 that's a little bit shorter. And so God has given those people over to do the filthy, filthy things their hearts desire. They do shameful things with each other. They exchange the truth about God for a lie. They worship and serve what God has created instead of the Creator Himself who is to be praised forever. Amen. Because they do this, God has given them over to shameful passions. Even the women pervert their natural use of their sex by unnatural acts. In the same way, the men give up natural sexual relationships with, relations with women and burn with passion for each other. Men do shameful things with each other, and as a result, they bring upon themselves the punishment they deserve for their wrongdoing. Because those people refuse to keep in mind the true knowledge about God, he has given them over to corrupted minds so that they do the things that they should not do. Wow. And the book of Leviticus, 
Moses, be, being directed by God, stated that any variation from the original plan of God was to, be, to be dealt with by death. He specifically mentions adultery, incest, and homosexuality. Wow. Do you think God still feels the same way? Yes. Mm -hmm. Why was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? Great wickedness. Yeah. I think I go to uh, was Ezekiel 16 it, because they didn't take care of the take care of the poor, the widows and orphans. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was a part of it. Yeah. We know what happened when the angels showed up there, don't we? Mm-hmm. But you think, violence, violence was uh, yeah. the way they dealt with everything is yeah. violent. Why do you think God made these very strong statements back at that point in human history? Remember that in the judgment, God will treat all sinners as his children and admit to heaven any, everyone that is safe to have there. Well, there's another set of passages, Romans 8. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 10, Galatians 5, Colossians 3, 1 Thessalonians 5. In these passages, which were all written by the Apostle Paul, he addresses he addressed some of the flagrant perversions rampant in the world in which he lived. He told us that when we choose to have a relationship with a prostitute, we are uniting ourselves with that person. Christians whose bodies are a part of the body of Christ should recognize that that is impossible. When we commit adultery or incest or homosexuality, we are committing sins against our own bodies. And he, he elaborates on that considerably. So what does it mean to think of your bodies as temple of God? Jim. God forgives those who repent of sin, 1 John 1, 9. The gospel enables individuals who formerly engaged in promiscuity and sinful acts sinful sexual activity to be part of the fellowship of believers because of the extent to which sin was altered excuse me has altered sexuality and humanity some may not be able to know full restoration in this aspect of human experience some for example might choose a life of celibacy rather than get involved in any sexual relationships that are forbidden, forbidden by God's word how should we as a church relate to for instance, homosexuals. How should their own attitude about their sexual orientation influence our response? Uh, yes. The Bible's got a guide. Back, or it says celibacy. Uh, really, that just means not marriage. It's yeah. chastity is, is uh, abstaining from yeah. sex. I need Dennis, to correct that. You've got the next section there. Yes, this is from, uh, well, it says Daughters of God. Would that would have been Sons and Daughters of God? Or? No, there's actually a separate book. Separate that, book. That this is a compilation, isn't it? Compilation. Ellen White's. Okay. Ellen White, Daughters of God, uh, 180.3 to 1. Uh, marriage has received Christ's blessing, and it is to be regarded as a sacred institution. True religion is not to counter, uh, is not counter, work. counter work the Lord's plans. God ordained that men and women should be united in holy wedlock to raise up families that crowned with honor would be symbols of the family in heaven. And at the beginning of his public ministry, Christ gave his decided sanction to the institution that had been sanctioned in Eden. <coughs> Thus he declared to all that he will not refuse his presence uh, on marriage occasions and that marriage, when joined with purity and holiness, Truth and righteousness is one of the greatest blessings ever given to the human family. Wow. Well, sexual love can be a wonderful, exhilarating experience, but the beauty of our outward physical bodies will not remain forever. Age brings deterioration and decay, and, but the, and there's no way to prevent that in our world. Not plastic surgery or any of those things. Nevertheless, Solomon and the Shulamite talked about a lifelong committed relationship between their because they belong to each other. Just look at a couple of these places. My lover is mine, I am his. He feeds his flocks among the lilies. Um, get my cursor to come back here. Chapter 6, verse 3. My lover is mine and I am his, and so forth. And it says this three different times in the book. 7.10 also. 
How would you compare Solomon's description of the Shulamite in Song of Solomon 4, 1 to 5, 6, 8, and 7, 1 to 9 with Adam's expression when he first saw Eve? Do we who are married still feel that way about our spouses? Or are, are, or are only men supposed to feel that way about their wives? Hmm. Well, Ephesians 5 says, Submit yourselves to one another because of your reverence to Christ. And see, then he talks about wives, and then he talks about husbands. So it sounds like this is supposed to be a mutual arrangement. Are you comfortable with the idea that God invented sex? Mm -hmm. What does that imply for our personal relationship with our spouses? There are many passages of Scripture that point that idea out. Um, we've already looked at some of them. Genesis 1.28, 4.1.9.1, Exodus 20, 14, uh, Leviticus 18.1-30, to 30, Proverbs 6.32, 1 Corinthians 6.9, Galatians 5.19, and Hebrews 13.4. Let me just read that. Marriage is to be honored by all, and husbands and wives must be faithful to each other. God will judge those who are immoral and those who commit adultery. So, Carrie, I think you're next. Yes, Seventh-day Adventists believe that bodies matter. What happens to the body is going to affect who a person is or becomes. Our belief in this causal relationship stems from our conviction that humans are a holistic unity of both physical and non-physical dimensions. A maxim often heard when discussing biblical anthropology is, quote, a human doesn't have a soul, a human is a soul, unquote. See Genesis 2.7. That means that bodily actions such as eating, exercising, physical contact, and sex are soulish activities and are not to be thought of as events isolated from affecting the whole person. Because God has created our bodies and has a serious stake in our well-being, it should be no surprise that he has something to say about our sexual lives. He knows just how important a subject it is. If any think that God is squeamish about the topic and has austere or puritanical restrictions on sexuality, then we commend you to the Song of Solomon. <laughs> That's from an adult Sabbath school Bible study. I, I love that. Margaret, I think you're next. How one views the relationship of our material dimensions, our bodies, to our um, immaterial dimensions, our mental, emotional, spirit, and spiritual states, has a tremendous influence on how we live. One of the most influential theological breaks our church made with the existing Christian tradition was to view the human as a whole rather than as a duality. Though we believe that a person is multifaceted, physical, spiritual, mental, and emotional, we believe all those dimensions are woven into a complex whole in which each dimension affects the other. Repercussions of this view are immediately apparent on a number of theological topics. One may be th tempted to think that the Adventist Church holds unique positions on any number of independent subjects, such as creation, resurrection, death, hell, sanctification, and health. But these positions are based on the biblical relationship of the human psyche, the human physi physicality, and the human physicality. Wait a minute. Our rela this is based on the biblical relationship of the human psyche with human physicality. It is our view of the wholeness of humans that informs and sets us apart from the duala dualism of fellow Christians. Wow. You that, may, that's still from the study guide? That is still from yes. the study guide. That's previous. Yeah. You may not think that Gnosticism has anything to do with Christian life in our times. But any time you think your body is not as important as what is done in your soul, you are in danger of flirting with the Gnostic dualistic philosophies and their consequences. Another problem with this view, besides its variance with biblical holism, is that it directly violates our experience. Sexuality is meant to be as much an act of the heart and spirit as it is of the body, and ideally, is to be an expression of a very non-physical entity we call love. 
Again, those in recovery from abusing their bodies in any numbers of ways like food, sex, drugs, etc. are often led to realize the core of their issues as non-physical. One self-image, dysfunctional relationships, emotional issues. In conclusion, our spiritual relational life with one another, with God, and with ourselves is dramatically affected by what we do in our bodies. The physical affects the spiritual and vice versa. This conclusion can be leveraged to support biblical principles of sexuality, premarital physical involvement, substance abuse, and health wellness issues. Gordon? Continuing from the Bible study guide, while traditional biblical values on sexual abstinence until marriage are often mocked as being an idealistic and antiquated killjoy, it turns out the opposite may be the case. There is evidence that having numerous sexual partners before committing to a single partner for life in marriage can undermine the prospects of high quality marriage. And the reference is given there. Yeah. Let that sink in for a moment. God should never be seen as restricting human pleasure, only as regulating it in order to maximize it in the proper time. Here our, sec here our second theme, timely love, comes into play, the light motif of the Shulamite charging the daughters of Jerusalem to not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Sexuality not only was meant to be expressed with a single mate for life, his eyes are as the eyes of doves, Remember, doves are known to mate for life, but was intended to be preserved till, threshold, till a threshold of personal and relational maturity was reached. There are some poor souls who are literally destroying whatever capacity they had for sexual pleasure through the illicit sexual activity. Through the Song of Solomon and other passages in Scripture, God is trying to use whatever means He can to preserve and maximize the emotional, relational, spiritual, and yes, physical satisfaction that marriage can bring. We should praise Him for it. Amen. Aren't you happy that God made us the way He made us? And, I mean, think of what we'll have to say to God about this for the rest of eternity as we live with Him. It's amazing what God has done, and we need to thank Him. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to have these opportunities to study Your Word and to think that such subjects as this are included in Scripture. May we learn from this lesson and others which have preceded it how we can better relate to our spouses, our families, and the other members of the church and in the, in the larger society in ways to be redeeming for all is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.